Once you have a, a plan set, you have goal set. And if you have goal set, then you can measure your success and how you're doing and how you're walking, uh, how you're going through that project. Business of Architecture, episode 276. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for growing an impactful and profitable architecture practice. Although they won numerous awards and were doing good work, architect Rodney Robles realized that something was missing in his firm. After ignoring the business aspect of the firm for the first seven years, he immersed himself on how to run a great practice from the business side, which has made a huge difference on his practice, his work, and his life. Rodney Robles is the founder of the architecture firm Factor Recurso based in Monterrey, Mexico. I was introduced to Rodney by Ryan Willard, who runs the business of architecture in the UK. Rodney's firm has won numerous awards and is frequently featured in the media, being recognized as emerging talent in 2010. Now, Rodney also runs a great Instagram channel, and so that's where we start today's conversation. In today's episode, you'll discover tips for using Instagram successfully as an architect. Rodney's two favorite business books, why Rodney pivoted after seven years to focus on the business side of his practice, and what he would tell his younger self about running a successful business. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's episode is sponsored by Gusto. Gusto makes managing payroll easy. One of the firm leaders in my architect CEO program said that Gusto has been a game changer for his business, allowing him to have big firm tools even though he has just a few employees. Running your payroll with Gusto takes seven minutes on average, and you can also add benefits and HR support to take care of your team and keep your business safe. Now, finding the best talent, it's important to be able to offer and compete with what large firms are offering in terms of health care and other benefits. Gusto can help you out with this. As a podcast listener, get three free months when you run your first payroll. Go to gusto.com forward slash BOA to get your three free months and support the show. Now, I want to give a special shout out to iTunes user L. Young, who said, I've been listening to this podcast for over a year. Enoch provides insightful, helpful information for architectural business owners. He brings in great guests who cover a variety of topics related to business. I highly recommend listening to him if you're an architect wanting to grow your business. Awesome. Thank you, user L. Young. Appreciate that. And if you haven't already left a review of the show, I would love to hear it. You can, and I'll give you a shout out here on the show. You can uh, leave a review on iTunes, of course, through any Android device or on your uh, Mac based computer by just firing up iTunes and searching for the Business of Architecture podcast. So, with that, let's get into today's interview and conversation with Rodney Robles, where we touch on everything from Instagram. Uh, business plans, how to focus on the strategy of running a practice, and much, much more. Rodney, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Hey, when we start out, I want, I want to get just talk quickly about Instagram. And I know that's how Ryan Willard, who's the, the host mm-hmm. of the Business of Architecture in the UK podcast, introduced us. Uh, you've been using Instagram for a while now, have a great Instagram account where you post lots of interesting content, great great pictures. And there's always some interesting Mexican architecture that you post on there as well. How long have you been on Instagram? Um, roughly about two years, maybe not that much. Okay. Two years. Years. Yeah. And how have you found it in terms of, uh, a medium for communicating with people and getting responses and connecting with people on that medium? Um, there's two things I like about Instagram. First of all, um, it's very eye candy oriented. I mean, it's, it's for pictures originally. And so um, most of the people that are on Instagram are people that are looking for graphic or visual um, images that are of very good quality. So um, what I like about that is that most of the people that are in Instagram are people who are interested in art or architecture or food or, I don't know, many things uh, versus the people who are found are interested in Facebook who are more of um, the work um, oriented type of people. And by work, I mean people who have a desk job. So um, 
I found that connecting with uh, other people who have the same interests as, as me, it's, it's been easier and mo most uh, immediate on Instagram. That's awesome. And what, what's your posting schedule? Do you have a posting schedule you follow? How does that work? Um, I try to watch my, um, how, my, how my audience reacts uh, to my posts. So sometimes I, because people react like, for example, Sundays. Sundays is a day, I don't know if, uh, how it works in the US, but over here, Sunday is a day where people are going to be with family. And whilst doing that, they're going to have some time to look at their um, social media. So Sunday at, I don't know, two o'clock, just before they're going to start having Sunday lunch with their family is a great time to post. Um, also, I try not to post on, on Mondays. Sometimes I do, but I, I try not to post on Mondays. I post mainly on Tuesdays, uh, Wednesday, and Thursday. Because Friday, people are going to be looking at, they're going to be want to be looking at people like people partying or people going out and stuff. So I try to keep it uh, condensed inside the, the week and on the weekends. I do have a schedule, but it's not like, an, like a set plan. So you use Instagram for personal, also business use. How have you found it in terms of developing business for the practice? Well, first I thought um, our clients were not gonna be on Instagram. Um, the reality is most of my clients um, are people who are 50 or older. And so I thought uh, my market was not going to be on Instagram. But then uh, I started asking around uh, with people who work with those clients who are of my age, I'm 35. And, and they started to tell me stories that um, clients sometimes come in the office uh, and say, oh, I... I saw this architect on my daughter's Instagram and so look him up or give him a call. And so um, first I thought I was not gonna have like people from my market or my potential clients on Instagram, but then I found out that they are there. Uh, probably not directly or some of them not directly, but they still are um, aware of what's happening on social media. Awesome. And so have you gotten any specific projects or have, have you had any experiences where a client has reached out to you because of something sure. they've seen on Instagram? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we've had uh, two particular cases of interior commercial projects that, have la that we've landed because of Instagram. And just because people just see us and like what we're doing and they're just they just go ahead and DM us directly. And through that DM, um, we get um, the commission for the job. Awesome. And what kind of, what kind of postings do you find do the best on Instagram? Uh, I think Insta stories are, you should focus on your Insta stories, not mainly on your feed because people want to see what you're doing immediately. I mean, that's the whole point of social media. They just want to, they want to see what you're doing on the on on that instant, right? So you gotta really work your Insta stories and tell people what you're doing, who you're doing it with, and where you're doing it, so that people like build this image of of who you are as a business person and what you can do for them. And your feed should just be curated and like have consistency. Um, um, on your posts, but mainly your Insta stories. I would say that your Insta stories are your golden geese right there. And for our listeners who aren't familiar with Instagram or Insta stories, describe to me what's the difference between the Insta story and the feed? The feed is um, like when you log in at, at Instagram or you, when you enter Instagram, it's what you see on a profile, on a profile page of a person. Um, it's just pictures of that person. It's a grid of pictures. And well, you can put there, um, like most of the time people have like a very good picture and just a little description of what's going on in the picture or, or content. You can, you can put content there. Um, but Insta stories are, um, like live 24 hour 
posts that are just there for 24 hours and they're, they're like small stories of what you're doing, 15 second stories of what you're doing uh, on, the, on that instant. <laughs> And so you can actually record a video and audio, of course, and that's about 15 seconds long. It goes into the Insta stories and then someone follows you. They can see either uh, an Insta story, something that happened instantly, like you said, or they can go to your, uh, your feed where they can see all the images that you've posted over time. And the Insta stories don't go directly to the feed unless you put them there intentionally, correct? Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. You can also save your Insta stories, the ones you like, for example, in my, uh, in my, uh, Instagram, you, I have like uh, saved Insta stories that are um, content oriented about marketing or about clients or about sales or um, some marketpreneur stuff on the top. And that's the stories I want to highlight. And that's the stories uh, that are there forever. The other ones are just uh, deleted after 24 hours. Yeah. And I, I love that. I mean, you've done a great job of this. I'm looking right now at your Instagram profile page. You have the way you have them divided up into categories, marketing, mm -hmm. raising capital, dealing with clients, leadership, the pitch, intern season, defining the clients. Uh, you have a number of them here. And now when do you decide to take these down or do they just grow over time in terms of how many of these topics that you'll have any, at any one time? I'll, I'm just flinging it right now. I'm just going I mean, I'm just like, what's my interest right now? And I just write it down and produce some content and, and upload it. It's not going to come down ever. I mean, they're just, I'm going to be adding stories as I go. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Now, in terms of the, the, the Insta stories, Rodney, what do you feel are the most successful ones that, that people engage with, that people enjoy that you've seen from your experience? Surprisingly, um, it's either architecture content or entrepreneur content oriented like the ones you're you're mentioning or super personal stuff like my vegan life or my diet or who i was at with a, in a party or what i'm what i'm thinking you gotta get real really 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 personal with your insta stories you cannot those are they have to be raw um they have they have to be super raw so people believe or you have this authenticity to your person. Um, that's what I believe people like. Well, that's what gets the most views on my feed, on my profile. Awesome. So those, those particular two types. Do you have any tips for shooting architecture? If architect, if our listeners are out there and they want to shoot some of their own architecture or start to build their Instagram feed, what would be some of your primary recommendations? I would say just document everything. Like just don't think about it, just take pictures. Of course, you gotta take good pictures. So it would be a good uh, idea to start watching other people, what they do, how they post, and like um, find this style you wanna post with and just go with it and follow through on that. You gotta have like your own style, your own uh, picture style. You can't just have everything on there and with different, you have, you got to have it curated in a way. Awesome. Now, Rodney, we, we did jump right into Instagram. I was curious to get your takes on that, but let's give our audience some, some background on who you are. Obviously there's the introduction to the podcast where I told them a little bit about who you are and your firm, but I'd like to talk about your story. You know, what got your initial interest in architecture and let's talk about what brought you up to where you are today. Okay. Um, initially, I wanted to study architecture and civil engineering. Um, I was very good at math and physics in school and high school, so I really liked um, uh, civil engineering as an option. But then I discovered this part of me that, I've, that I had always, that I was uh, very good at drawing and very good at imagining stuff and producing ideas in, in, in the whole creativity realm of my life and the whole numbers realm what were always there. So I started studying both. Uh, I started studying uh, both um, uh, civil engineering and architecture. And by fourth semester, um, I dropped out of civil engineering just because uh, I realized I was uh, more in tune with my creative side than my number side or uh, maybe I thought the number side was always going to be there. So I, 
I dropped out of um, uh, civil engineering and just went on with architecture. Mm -hmm. Then um, I graduated and I had uh, the luck uh, at a poker table with some friends. Um, a friend of mine, well, uh, he said, my father's going into a restaurant business. He's going to be uh, coaching some restaurant owners and they need an architect. And so I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I, if, I mean, set an interview for me. And I got this interview set and I was competing with other architects or other firms. I did not have a firm. I did not have anything. I just not, no name, no experience, no nothing. Uh, I think they gave me the job because I charged too little. <laughs> I think they gave me, I underpriced everybody. Of course, I didn't know anything about pricing or anything, but I'm, I'm fairly sure they gave me a job because of that. And I don't know, five days after graduating, I had my first commission and I've not stopped ever since. Well, let's talk about that. So you went into this probably, like you said, your own words, charging too little. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you didn't have an understanding of how to set the fees. How did that first project go being your first project? Well, I really redlined that one. Um, I went broke for like six months after that one. Um, it did not go well. The project in, on its own was very good. It had a lot of recognition. It gave me a lot of new clients and, and it brought me new jobs. And, um, but money-wise or business-wise, it did not go that well. Um, in fact, it did not go that well for the, five, for the first five years of, of my firm. Uh, probably seven, maybe. <laughs> um, I'm stretching it there because... Um, we were always struggling um, with uh, the baseline, um, with money and the business in, um, as a whole. Uh, the creative part, we have a lot of awards here in Mexico. We have interior design awards. We have awards for architecture. Um, we produce very good product, but we did not have like this, the whole business, because um, nobody teaches you that in school, right? I mean we studied architecture, not MBA or, or some business oriented career. So it was pretty tough for me to get into that notion that I, that, that architecture, um, uh, af after being an art or after being whatever architecture is, uh, it's also a business or it's first a business, right? So, uh, it took me a while to realize that I needed to start, uh, putting attention to the business side of architecture. And that was about five years ago uh, when, I, when I really took this decision of, you know, I got to start worrying less about the projects and more or the awards or whatever I'm trying to do and more about the business side of architecture. Mm -hmm. What were some of the lessons that you learned about in those first seven years that you said were very difficult, where you didn't have a good grasp on the money? What were some lessons looking back, uh, some reasons maybe that you thought you were struggling during that time? Um, I think pricing was like one of the most important ones. Um, um, also getting new business. I was... Um, I was, I was just, um, um, like I was, my business was based on word of mouth clients. I did not have like this marketing strategy or people didn't know, did not know who I was. So just, I did a project and it got completed. And then someone drove, drove past it and said, I like it, call the architect, find who the architect is. And that's how my business went for like seven years. Um, so those are those two um, really, really hurt me and uh, business wise. And the other thing that happened was the pyramid for human or arts or um, at school, like, like the whole, there was like this shift from engineering in the nineties and, and eighties to this whole humanities careers. And there were a lot of architects. I mean, a lot. Um, 
like my class was, I don't know, 100 architects. And if you extrapolate that to all the universities here in my locality, we, it meant that you were having like 1,000 architects per semester graduating. And what that did was more people were coming out and because there were fewer jobs or really not enough jobs, more people were opening their own firms. And so like I did when I first graduated, they were underpricing everybody. So there was this combination of what I was doing wrong or what I was not doing uh, right and what was happening uh, in the context of architecture in Monterrey or Mexico in general. So you mentioned that you, you had your pricing wrong um, mm -hmm. during those seven years. What have you done to correct that? I study my competition a lot and like really get in tune with the market. But what, what we, what's most work for us is mystery shopping everyone. Like I really, cause there's not, there's no regulation here for what you can charge. There's no baseline or top for the, there's, there's nothing that regulates that here. So it's a free market. And so what I did, I started uh, just making like uh, soliciting work from architects, not myself, but through people and um, like mystery shopping everyone. So I knew what they were charging and I could position myself um, like for certain projects under price or for cert or fairly or highly. I mean, I could measure that. That's what I've been doing like for the past four years. And going through that, what are you discovering? Are you discovering that most firms are undercharging? Where, what have been the realizations you've gotten from doing that? Um, it's very volatile. I mean, some people charge a lot of money and some people for the same projects charge a considerable amount less. Like I'm talking, I don't know, 200% less or 300% less. It's, it's very difficult to measure that. So what we've been doing is always looking at our business or, and what our business uh, consumes in money and our resources and what we need uh, to move along and trying to match that to what uh, we can charge uh, out there. Because there's always going to be someone underpricing us and there's always going to be someone who's more expensive than us. And how do you set that pricing? Let's say you find out, you kind of have an idea what the other architects are charging. Do you have a target profit percentage or how do you end up coming up with the eventual fee? Exactly, exactly. I mean, well, uh, we have like, a, like the profit, uh, we want our goal profit and then our budget for the whole year. And then we try to match um, that with what's going on out there. Out there. So does the profit percentage, does it vary from project to project or do you just kind of have a profit percentage for the year that you're shooting for? For the year. Yeah, we have like, uh, we have that for the, for the office or for the year. Yeah. And what's a, what's a profit margin goal that you have? Right now, we're at 12%. Okay. And how do you think that compares with other firms that are competing against you in your market? Well, you see, our market is um, either you're like, there's, there's like this imaginary line when you have like this combination of a lot of work and you know clients or people or connections. And if you get to that level, you can, you kind of just rise a lot. I mean, you kind of charge whatever you want and you kind of do whatever you want and your business is very health healthy. And there's offices here in Monterrey that have 80 employees, 60 employees, 90 employees that dominate markets. Like there's people who dominate the residential market, there's people who dominate the commercial market. And then there's all these emerging talents, which I kind of, I'm part of that. And we're just waiting in line to get that opportunity to step up. And once you get there, well, you can charge whatever you want. And then there's this sea of people uh, that are recent graduates that are opening their own firms that are just underpricing everything. So it's 
I'm kind of stuck in the middle. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a very aggressive pricing based market mm-hmm. um, down there, which is probably it's very true around the world. You know, here in the United States, we, we have this as well. What have been some of the strategies, Rodney, that you found to be able to close a deal or win a client even when you're not the cheapest? Um, I think having a good portfolio works like having a successful, uh, portfolio and by successful, I mean that you make money for other people or that, um, you get the prices or the awards. That's very important because, uh, that builds like this image that you are a successful person and that you're going to do a very good job and that gives value to your work. That's one uh, part. The other part I would say, like how do do you convince clients to go with you if you're not, um, would be experience and service. Both of those are important. Like like today, you you cannot tell the difference between an, an office that has a 15 years of experience and one that has one year just by its renderings or just by its like what they're posting or what they have on their webpage. Cause technology is, we live in a world or I don't know how to say it, that technology is very good. So renders are going to be the same um, in, in a 15 year old uh, office than in a zero year old office. What's going to make the difference really is um, how they turn those projects into reality. So I try to tell my clients that, you know, we've walked 11 years um, in this office. So we have the experience to, to make you money, to uh, take care of you and, and, and really do a, a good successful uh, job. And the other thing um, that works for me is um, I offer like the whole service. Like I work um, since market analysis and investigation and research um, to the supervision of the construction project. So we, if you brought in your services, people are gonna want to go with you because they're not gonna have to uh, subcontract different consultants or different companies. They're just gonna go with one. So that's worked for me a lot. Like. I can do the whole thing, the whole service. That's worked for me a lot. Hey, Architect Nation, real fast. I want to draw your attention to May 1st through the 3rd, 2019. I'm hosting the Architect Business Summit in Chicago, Illinois, and I would love to meet you there in person. During these three days, some of the most successful architects I've had the pleasure of working with will pull back the curtain to reveal what they're doing to grow their income, freedom, and impact as firm owners. This will be the must attend event for architecture firm owners in 2019. You won't want to miss this. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash live to get information on who will be speaking and find out how to grab your ticket. Awesome. Let's talk about the other thing you mentioned was marketing, business development, getting new projects. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your thoughts on that. You've shared a lot of content around that on Instagram. What are your thoughts on the marketing of architectural services? Well, here in Mexico, I don't know, um, it, it's probably the same everywhere, but who you know is it's very important. So you can have a um, recent graduate that has um, a family with a lot of money and he'll start doing, getting a lot of commissions that are very good projects, that are very expensive projects, and they're, all, they're getting the awards and the attention and just because of the connections he's had, like, from his family. The good thing about social media is that it breaks that up. I mean, it breaks that, that cycle that you need. It's not, it's not anymore about who you know, but who you get to know and social media allows for that. And so I think it's very important to be on social media because it allows you to have, um, new connections and make new connections and get the commissions and get and know the people. Uh, does that, is that like answering the question a little bit? Yeah. So you talked about marketing. One of the things you brought up was social media. So you feel that that plays an important role in the marketing of your firm is social media. I think it's 
uh, it gives us access to people uh, that would otherwise I would not have access to. And people, I mean, the only thing that will never die in a business is people. Um, so it, that for me is like the hugest bet. Like if you get to know people. Also, I mean, I, I'm a lot in social media, but I'm, I'm also very active in like public relations and, and, and the whole architecture scene in Monterrey. Um, I've, I've been organizing events. I've been part of, um, it's like El Colegio de Arquitectos, which is um, like our club here. I don't know how to, it's like the like AI, association. Yeah, mm -hmm. the association here. And uh, with media related to architecture, like magazines and that. Um, so I, that part, the, the PR, the going out there also works a lot. Um, marketing through radio or mass media or the newspaper is, I've, I've never heard that of that working. Um, it's more like a direct connection between people. So my suggestion was, would be to go out there and start meeting people, start shaking hands, start going to networking events. Um, Cause nothing is gonna, um, nothing's gonna substitute that people on people connection. Yeah. What, what, what prompted your interest in entrepreneurship? You seem to have, you, you're recently involved in a, um, a conference that was held down mm -hmm. there in Mexico. Why the interest in entrepreneurship? What, what sparked this for you, Rodney? Well, I guess about, about five years ago, I guess I was really fed up with um, not having like a business, just having like a job or a firm. And we were doing okay in projects, but I really wanted to, I got very interested in this part of the business side of architecture. And so um, I started reading a lot on business and watching your podcasts and watching people around the world, what, what they were doing and, and reading books. And I started doing this whole research on entrepreneurship or as I call it, archipreneurship. And um, that really got me interested in, in the whole business of architecture scene. Uh, this event, this Congress uh, you're talking about, I organized it. I pitched it about four years ago to this association, El Colegio Arquitectos, and it got benched for a while. And then a new president came up and he was really interested in, in attracting new, uh, the youth, because um, it was like very, there was a lot of, well, old people, I'm going to say, it's not, it's not how you say it, but there was a lot of, um, uh, yeah, older architectures, older architects. And uh, he was really interested in, in, in doing, what can we do to attract young people? And so I said, well, the only way you're going to attract us is one, by bringing us together, and two, um, by giving us some content that we are really interested in. And if you're producing content, architecture content for architects, it's kind of redundant. So why, what don't, don't they teach us at school? It's this business side uh, that they don't teach us. So we organized this Congress uh, that was called Architecture Insiders because it was like uh, bringing uh, experts or our leaders from important firms uh, to talk from the inside about PR and about um, brand and about their sales and, and their whole business experience and, and what they were doing. And, and this uh, really sparked uh, like this movement or interest in business uh, throughout the whole architecture scene here in Monterrey because everybody's having the same problem. Everybody's struggling. I mean, you can see them, uh, you, you may see them in magazines and you think they're, they're doing great, but as a business, because nobody teaches us that, um, everybody's struggling. That's the reality. What were some of the key takeaways from that Congress that you had in terms of the content that was shared or some of the high points? 
Um, there's one subject nobody spoke of that I was really um, urging to hear, and that was sales. Nobody spoke of sales. We got people uh, speaking of operations and how they manage their office. And we got, we got people speaking of, of teamwork and collaboration and how, they, how to build a brand, but nobody, nobody touched uh, sales. And I don't know because I think maybe it's because it's kind of a secret, like you don't wanna give your secret of how you do your sales. Or, I, I mean, that's what I think. Um, but I think that's the pillar of every business. I mean, sales is the pillar of every business. If you're not selling, you are not going to get new clients and you're just going to rely on word of mouth and it's, your business is not going not gonna to grow. So I was really, I mean, we talked about a lot of things, but I was really looking forward to hearing on sales, which was not, uh, I did not get the pleasure of hearing that. <laughs> What's your personal take on sales, Rodney? Well, I think you have to be a very good salesman if you want to have a successful business um, or someone in your firm has to be doing sales. Um, it's the only way to really grow um, your business. Um, it's, I mean, if you do not have sales, you, you may have a very good product and you may have an excellent service, but if you're not selling it, then nobody's going to, people still need to consume that product and that service. So, I mean, if you're not doing sales, you're just lying there and waiting. It's not the way uh, to grow your business. And what do you find to be the most effective way? Well, tell me this. What does sales mean for you? What does sales mean for me? Sales means like sales is a part of marketing, right? And so you have to have this whole marketing campaign and strategy working for you on the background. Uh, but particularly what sales means is uh, like marketing will close the gap between your product and service and the people you're, you're marketing uh, to, your market, right? That's what it will try to do. And the final part, when people decide to make that purchase or consume your service or whatever, that's the sale. Um, what does it mean in terms of business? It means having more clients, new clients, recurring clients, taking care of your clients. Uh, basically it means having more projects and thus more money and profit and growing and I mean, you got to sell. What have you found to be the fundamental pillars of successful selling? Trust. People got to trust you. Um, for that, you have to be very, very um, honest. You have to be very honest with people. And that's number one. I mean, if you're not, if people... Like people are not going to buy your product because it's a good product or a beautiful product or um, people are going to buy your product because they trust you. And also clients you have will um, like will tell other people uh, about you if they trust you. Uh, so trust is like the number one for me. Um, also sales is like a behavior. I mean, you, you have to change the whole way you're selling yourself, not just uh, your business, but you as a representative of that business, you got to seem like, like, a, like a good person and a good professional. And you can't be, you can't have bad habits or have like this crazy life and try or expect people to want to buy from you because in fact, they're not going to buy from your business. They're going to buy from you or whoever is selling you. Um, so like, I don't know what other things I'm, I'm actually writing right now about sales. So you got me like you, you, you got me a little like, I don't know. I haven't put my ideas together uh, on that, 
But honesty, surely, for sure, is the number one, I would say. Uh, that's very, very important. And what would you feel are the some of the top things that someone can do to help someone trust them? What would you say would be the tactics to do that? Well, you got to be genuine. You got to be yourself. Um, and you got to be just, I mean, honest. <laughs> it's like people, when they're selling, they're, they're promoting some idea that they're like trying to convince other people. So they're, they're, they're painting this picture where, where they're the best, that they can do everything, and sometimes overselling their own selves, right? So what happens is you may have, you may go ahead with close that sale. You may close that sale, but then people are going to know what you're really made of and what you, you really doing. And that's when things start backfiring. So I would say you got to be real honest on what you can and cannot do for people and how you can and cannot help them. Uh, So for example, uh, sometimes we get uh, projects that are too large for us and we go ahead and just say, you know what? I cannot uh, do this project by myself. I I may have to uh, do it with someone else or, or simply I cannot do it by myself, period. Like it's too large for my office. Um, Why? Because if we take on that challenge, although we've done it before, (laughs) um, you may, uh, drop the ball. And if you drop the ball, that's just gonna close that door for you. So you want to make sure if you're, if you're handling a new project, a big, a big project, you want to make sure you can really, really, really commit to the project and really follow through on that project. Um, so you gotta be really, really honest, uh, on sales. Like that's super important for me. Awesome. Going back to the Congress that you had, Rodney, what would you say would be some of the, uh, obviously you wish that some would have spoken on sales. No one did. Mm -hmm. Uh, However, you talked about, you know, some people did speak on operations. Were there any other key takeaways from that experience? I I really liked uh, one conference uh, by Bernardo Posas, uh, who really dominates the market here on residential market. uh, uh, He really dominates the residential market right now. Uh, he has he has like 200 projects right now going on at the same time and an 80 80 person staff and it's it's a very good office and a very good operation um, what he was saying was um, he was talking about clients he was talking about how you should you should choose your clients like not every not every clients for you so uh, although he has a lot of projects he sometimes refuses some clients because of the, of the personality of that client and how that could ruin um, the project or the operation or whatever. Um, so I really liked uh, his posture on, you know, there are some people you don't want to work with. Um, you got to have that eye and you got to know who, um, who you do not want to work with. Like, Picking your clients is very, very important. Uh, that, that I liked a lot. That it's not. It was just a part of his whole speech, but I, it really stuck with me. Hmm? Anything else? Um, well, I like the PR uh, conference um, by Dolores. Uh, she is a PR for Legorreta, which is a very important um, uh, office and she really talked about the importance of uh, public relations um, as a way to produce new projects and as a way to represent your projects and and how once something goes out of the office um, it's very important to have like this consistency of image and message that you're sending out to the world 
so the world um, or your market knows what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it. And that part was uh, important for me. And the, the, the last one I took, like I really liked was uh, Ignacio Cadena uh, from Cadena Concepts. He was talking about um, how your brand or building a brand is very, very important um, as an architecture firm because it'll, it'll work with you to sell what you're trying to do or to sell like this idea of like this message or idea you're sending as a brand is very important for clients to perceive so you don't have I mean I don't know how to put it like like being consistent with your brand as an overall is very important uh, so people know what you're doing and, and what you stand for particularly um, and like having like this portfolio that really has um, a continuous concept to it like not just doing stuff for clients because they want that but stuff for clients because they need a solution your way you, you am i making sense <laughs> yes and that leads into my next question which is how do you where does your personal expression fit in the firm and in terms of the firm being an avenue for you to find personal fulfillment how have you found that the practice oh. fulfills you personally well since i started this practice uh by myself it's basically an extension of me um, the whole language, the whole operation, the way we work as a team, uh, the way we collaborate with other offices, the way I sell, um, I make sales, the way, the, the way we market, the way we do everything is an extension of me. Uh, this is a two-sided uh, weapon because um, it's very strong if, it, if you have that uh, unity between yourself and your brand or your office, it's very strong as a message. And it's very easy to deliver and you don't have to uh, sugarcoat it and you don't have to fake it. So it's very natural for me. But sometimes um, people, because of my personality, can, my personality can be expressed through my firm and sometimes that can cause some friction with some people. But hey, haters gonna hate. So no one, I mean, I'm not worried about that part. But in, in my experience, it's, I mean, like my office is an extension of me 100%. Now, Rodney, if you were to go back 10 years ago and sit down with the younger Rodney Robles and have a conversation about uh, giving him some advice about running a firm what would you tell yourself? Oof. Well, first thing I would do was like really plan and strategize and build a business, not just go out there and, and provide a service and making plans and projects for people. Like, like have this business plan really worked out. Like the first thing I do in my other projects, because I have, I have like Factor Recurso as a firm, but then there's Panorama, uh, that's the organizer of these events we're talking about, and other stuff in entrepreneur related uh, things. Like the first thing I do is like really work the business plan out. Because once you have a, a plan set, you have goal set. And if you have goal set, then you can measure your success and how you're doing and how you're walking, uh, how you're going through that project. Um, so I did not do that when I first started. I just, I mean, I knew what I had to do because at school they teach you what you have to do um, in terms of work to be able to build a project. Uh, but they never teach you what you have to do in terms of business to be able to get more business and grow your business and all that. So first thing I would do, I would say, Hey, young Rodney, um, take these books on entrepreneurship and business in general and start reading and start getting interested in the part of business, not just the part of architecture. That's what I would say. Can you think of any of the top books that would be on that reading list? 
Oof. <laughs> um, I really liked E Myth. I mean, that was like one of the first books I read, the E Myth. And there's a special one for architects. Um, that book, like, it got me redirected um, towards uh, more business inclined uh, mindset. And there's also this one called The Dip that talks about um, when you go into this dip of, of bad habits or, or bad situation, like, like in poker, they say like a bad beat. Um, like you can stay there just in that cul-de-sac all the time or, or how to just go out and, or start again or whatever. Like those two books really changed a lot, especially e -Myth. It was a very simple book. It's a very, it's like almost like a manual and that one changed a lot. But I mean, I've read lots of books. Um, my father, um, he has on, uh, he gave to me um, 758 books on business. So I, I, I got this whole library on business um, from the 80s and 90s and uh, 2000s. And I've been reading them um, continuously. Uh, I particularly, I like the old ones, the old books, or like from the 80s and 90s, because they're very theory inclined. Uh, the new books seem to be very motivational. They seem to be more uh, motivational inclined, like you can do it and um, how to be successful by having a mindset to be successful. But the old books really get down into the grind and numbers and, and the, the theory of how you're supposed to do it as a business. So I really like the old ones. Um, fact is, the old ones are, well, they're old books, so they're not going to make any sense in marketing or they're not going to make any sense because there was no social media. Um, so you got to like, I try to work the old theories in with the new ideas and motivational stuff together uh, to build like this uh, new idea on where business is going in my life. Awesome. Now you talked about having a very, wanting to take a very intentional approach in terms of a business plan. Mm -hmm. Walk us through, if you were sitting down with your, you know, your, the younger Rodney and mm -hmm. you said, Hey, look, we need to take, what I recommend is that you take a strategic approach to business that you actually mm -hmm. plan some things out instead of just, just doing the projects and just making money that way. Let's take a longer term strategic approach. What would be the things that you would have Rodney do to accomplish that? What would that business plan look like? Okay. Well, first of all, and here's, here's like where it all makes a difference. Like, first of all, you got to have a very clear idea of what you're doing, um, how you're doing it and why you're doing it. Like those three questions are like the basis of every business plan. Like, what are you going to do? Exactly. What are you going to do? Like, who, how are you going to help people? How are you going to? What's your idea? What's your product going to look like? And then this, how you're going to do it, like work out how you're going to go about uh, on doing what you're going to be doing. Right. Um, and then the why, which is um, very important, like why you want to do this. Um, so those three questions, once you answer all those three questions, then you can go that discerning or, uh, dissecting or classifying or working out each of them like into particular uh, things like what you can start enlisting your services like this these are my services and and they're going to be limited to how and why you're doing it right and then how uh, well how are we going to do those services like are you going to subcontract people with this one or are you going to um, have your own staff or uh, what kind of technology are you going to be using? Like really, um, really describe how you're going to do it uh, in terms of like the actual work. And then the why, which is very important, like ultimately what's the purpose of what you're trying to do? Because if you have that clear, then the what and the how are going to be like very, very clear too. And once you have that set, I believe you have to set yourself some goals like 
okay, I want to be doing this for how long and achieve what and with how many people or whatever your goals are and just start working to get to those goals. Um, that would be like the minimal, 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 minimal idea of what a business plan should um, try to achieve or work on. Of course, there's all these sections and financing and, and your pitch and your value proposition and all these parts. But if I, if, if of course, uh, young Rodney would not know any of that, but um, those three questions are like the most important part of a business plan for me. Like if you have that clear, the rest will just fall into its place. And what are the, th what are the answers for Factor Recurso for those three questions right now? Okay. Um, so what we do, uh, we do architectural concepts. And so I'm thinking it in English. That's probably written behind me because you're probably seeing it written behind me. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, on your website too, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, we create successful architectural concepts. That's like the what. And how we do it um, is through a business-oriented um, uh, approach to architecture. So I don't, I don't usually work with, uh, I don't know how to say it, but pri private clients or patrimonial clients. I don't know how it's translated. Like, like I'm not in the residential business. I'm more in the commercial uh, architecture business. So I work with investors. Uh, so how we do it is we really have a very successful investigation and research approach and we approach your project as a business. I'm not thinking on it uh, in, in architecture terms as much as we're thinking on it as a business uh, with a market and as a product that we're going to have to sell. So that's the how. And the why we do it is probably the same as everyone's answer. Um, because we love it, because we believe um, we can do a very successful job for you. And um, we believe we can all make, um, we can all win from this uh, relationship. Um, you caught me off guard because you're, you're asking me, I, I have to translate it into English and it's really hard. Uh, but that's more or less um, what I would say. Mm -hmm. Hey, before I let you go though, Tell me about um, panora Panorama okay. because uh, we may, we may want to let some of our other listeners in Mexico or other countries know about this, uh, this venture that you're coming up with. Okay, so Panorama is a platform for our entrepreneurship in Mexico. Like we do, not, it's going to be the first, uh, the first platform for uh, our entrepreneurs in Mexico. What we're going to do is we're going to help people who want to, um, have a business uh, of architecture or architecture related business. We're going to help them uh, with their business. And what are we going to do? We're going to be hosting events and producing uh, video content and writing articles and like really producing all this content so people um, can look at it and hopefully um, have a better business understanding that if you have a better business um, you will have better profits which is one and thus have a better service or be able to produce or deliver a better service and have more impact on your community and the whole context of architecture as a whole so that's what we're doing in, at panorama Awesome. And where can people go to both find out about Panorama and also about your firm? Okay. Uh, so my firm is factorrecurso.mx um, and Panorama is um, panoramaarc.mx um, and an Instagram, which would be easier. Our handle is at factorrecurso and Panorama's handle is at Panorama MX uh, lower dash, lower dash, two lower dashes at the end. Um, easiest would be to just 
go to my handle in Instagram, which is at rodney.robles, which is spelled R-O-B-L-E-S. And from there, you can see the other links uh, as a whole. We've not launched Panorama yet, but we're about to launch it, hopefully um, in a week or a week and a half. Uh, so by the end of this month, um, it's going to be, it's all going to be working out. Great. Well, let me know when you do so I can share that with uh, my listeners as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. And that sounds like a fantastic place to wrap up, uh, wrap up our conversation today, Rodney. Thank you. So Rodney Robles, thank you for being with us and sharing your knowledge, your experiences, uh, and your challenges here on the business of architecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars that I've prepared specifically for firm owners like yourself. In the first one, you'll discover how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelming fires that plague so many firm owners, especially the growing pains if you're starting to get more and more work and finding that you don't have enough time in the day. In this particular training, you're going to learn the big firm strategies that you can use even if you have a small firm, which I define as uh, 30 or less employees, anywhere from zero to 30. You can go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently using a few of the strategies that I talk about here on the show. You can go to architectwebinar.com to access this free on-demand training. Today's episode is sponsored by Gusto. Gusto makes managing your payroll easy it allows you to have big firm tools, even though you have just a few employees. Running payroll with Gusto takes seven minutes on average, and you can add benefits and HR support to help you take care of your team and keep your business safe. As a podcast listener, get three free months when you run your first payroll by going to gusto.com forward slash B-O-A. As always, the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.